Does anybody know where this picture came from? Union? Not Union. Bay? Not Bay. Davis Bill? No. Kind of dry dock thing going on here. Yeah. That's Ben's got the right clue. Some kind of repair facility? Yep. Is Greenwood Greenwood Yards did an a doors open earlier this year. It was their first ever. And this is their painting room. And I don't know why they were painting a subway car, but they were. Tagging it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. So we've got a uh, meetup. That's where we normally announce our meetings now. I think, uh, once again, I failed to make any announcements on the mailing list, so. <laughs> There's 650 people in the meetup group or something. Yeah, yeah, I think the meetup outnumbers the mailing list subscriptions anyway. So if you're not on the meetup yet, you should be, so you can find out when the next meeting is. Um, we record all these meetings, and the videos are posted on our website. There's also a meetup page now with the videos on it. Um, and we maintain a job postings mailing list. I don't think we've had any posts this month. Nope. Most months we have a handful, at least, that make it through, uh, plus dozens more that have nothing to do with Java or Toronto that we don't post there. So as members of the JUG, you get to enjoy discounts on O'Reilly books. So use this code if you need to buy an O'Reilly book and pay less money. <coughs> so Java news from the past month. The state of the module system blog post from uh, Mark Reinhold came out. He's the sort of the head honcho in charge of Java development. He wrote quite a lengthy and interesting blog post about Project Jigsaw, which has been like a really long time coming. I think, when was the first demo we saw of it? Java 1? Five years ago or something. 2009, something like that. Yeah, yeah. so it's finally coming in Java 9, and they're committed. Uh, and now what Jigsaw means, uh, this is just from the first paragraph of that blog post is that um, they have sort of two big goals for Jigsaw, which is to provide reliable configuration, basically replace the class path with something that's not just a big flat list of, of places to look for classes, and encapsulation, which means you finally get to say, OK, even though I have some public classes and some packages, I don't want other people using those packages. Those are like internal, maybe shared among all of the packages inside my module, but they're not for consumption outside of my module. So you get to say all those things. You get to be explicit about which packages in your jar can be consumed publicly. And yeah, great for, great for all sorts of stuff. Um, it's kind of that missing modifier between private and default that we never had. Or between default and protected, maybe? Anyway, yeah. Yeah, between default and protected. So that's a really good read anyway, if you've got a, probably like an hour to spare. I read it last night, well worth the time. There is a fundraiser for a new version of JUnit on Indiegogo, and we should probably all contribute. I've certainly spent a fair bit of time using JUnit and no time contributing to it, so I guess I could give them some money to help fund a, a new revision that takes full advantage of Java 8 language features. So this week, uh, just a few days ago, was the original cutoff, but <coughs> the contributions were still rolling in, so they extended it for another 15 days, and it's open for contributions until October 2nd. So we should all do that. Uh, there was a fairly serious disruption in DynamoDB over the weekend. That's uh, Amazon's version of Google Bigtable, essentially, that you can use as a subscription service. I wrote the wrong thing. It says RDS failed. It wasn't. It was DynamoDB failed. RDS is a different service. Uh, they had a great blog post explaining in, in great detail exactly the sequence of events that led to the outage. And they also explained what they're going to do to prevent this from happening again. So kudos to them for being really transparent. 
really interesting to write if you do any programming in network systems to see how this failed and maybe prevent doing the same thing <coughs> yourself. They had a, basically a metadata service that every storage node had to talk to. They turned on a new feature late last week, and a few very large customers started taking advantage of it. Um, this <coughs> tripled the amount of requests they were sending to the metadata service. The metadata, the metadata service got slow, went beyond the threshold where nodes say, if I can't contact the metadata service for this long, I should make myself unavailable. And so 45% of the nodes were unavailable at any given time early Sunday morning because of the timeouts. Um, and they were unable to increase the capacity of the metadata service because it was so constrained, they couldn't send the administrative requests to grow the cluster. So they had to turn off access to everybody, let the load settle down, grow the metadata service capacity, and then turn it back on. So the 55% failure rate turned into a 100% failure rate because they couldn't grow the service while it was so stressed. <coughs> so anyway, the admirable job on their write-up. It was they didn't they didn't try to pretend any of it wasn't their fault, and uh, we all we all could have done the same thing, for, for sure. And finally, if there's any JetBrains users in the room, you probably saw they changed the way they charge money for IntelliJ. Um, it used to be you'd buy a license and it would be good for whatever upgrades come out within the next year and then you'd be on that version forever. So they changed it to more of a perpetual subscription model where you're supposed to pay every year. But in that change, it also changed the terms of if you stop paying for your subscription, then you have to go back to the version that was current when your subscription started. So <laughs> they basically took away the year of free upgrades is what they did. And um, so there was some community outcry about that and other things. And they did revise the policy somewhat in response to that. And uh, this tiny URL here at the bottom has uh, more details on that whole saga, which is probably still ongoing because it was just a few days ago. And finally, it's conference season. So just go quickly through Java Zone happened. They had a bunch of content, and it's all online already, free for everybody forever. So definitely check that out. There's got to be a lot of good stuff to see there. Uh, Spring 1, 2GX happened, and I got to go this year. It was my first time going to that conference, and that was a lot of fun. It was three days of talks, tons of stuff about Spring and Groovy and Grails. Um, they also recorded all the talks, but I think they're charging money for access to them. Um, they gave the attendees a passcode to get access, like DevOps does the same thing. Um, and I. Yeah, they sort of trickle them out over time. They have all the content available right away if, if you went or if you pay. But, but a year later or, or so. Right? Yeah, by the time the next DevOps happens, all the talks from the previous one are, are available for free. Um, my highlight from this was the, the opening keynote where they said um, Spring 5 will, if everything goes according to plan in their schedule and the JDK schedule, it's going to support JDK 9 on launch day, so there would be no reason to not upgrade to Java 9 when it comes out if you're a Spring user. So that's cool. And Java 1, of course, coming up. Tickets are still available until the end of tomorrow. You can use that promo code to save 200 bucks. It's a great conference. If you've never been, you should go. And uh, I think they just announced yesterday that they're, they have this appreciation event, event every year where they rent it's called Treasure Island. And everybody who's going to the conference goes to that. Um, I think their headline act this year is Elton John. So you get to see him too for that price. It's a great conference anyway. And DevOps is coming up in November, but it's already sold out. So if you don't have a ticket, you have to wait for next year. <coughs> Anything else? There's a Scala conference here in Toronto tomorrow and the next day. Actually, Scala up north. Awesome, Scala up north. Can you still register for it? I'm not sure. I did yesterday, so. Okay. Two hundred bucks. Good deal. Nice. That is a good deal. 
Anything else? No new Java's releases or anything like that. So no, we usually report on at least one new yeah, Java. Five but months for releases. Mm -hmm. OK, this will turn it over to Angelo. Uh, so uh, giving a talk today on uh, category theory, or at least uh, a bit of it anyways. Uh, so a little bit about me before we get started. Uh, I'm Angelo Genovese. I've been uh, in development in software development plus or minus 15-ish years. Um, the last three years or so, I've been really interested in uh, become really interested in Scala functional programming, and and through that, I've become interested in category theory because a lot of the uh, the structures that are used in functional programming come from category theory. Um, a little bit of what I, about what I'm not. I am not at all, by any means, an expert in category theory. My, uh, my level of math is probably lower than a, a good three quarters of the room, if not more. Um, <coughs> but I've started to learn about this stuff, and I've found it really interesting, and I hope, uh, I hope to share some of that, that journey with you guys. Uh, so what am I talking about? Uh, I want to cover a few topics today. Um, so what is category theory? Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a live code demo, which goes against one of my personal rules, so hopefully I don't make too big of a fool of myself. Um, showing you some, some of the uh, constructs from category theory. Um, and then uh, while preparing for this talk, I uh, started to port a Scala library uh, that builds on a lot of these structures into Java. And so I'm going to do a little bit of promotion of that, and hopefully uh, some people might, might be interested in giving me a hand with that if, uh, if the talk goes well. So what's category theory? So this is the, uh, the Google, if you search Google for category theory, this is what comes up. Um, really, it's a, a very um, high level theoretical area of mathematics. Um, and it takes patterns from other areas of mathematics uh, and looks for ways to abstract them to be, so that they can be used in new, new ways. Um, and a lot of those patterns have been now since been translated into code and are, are really what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, by the way, if anyone has questions at any point, if I'm going too quickly, please feel free, stop me. I, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, well, happy to attempt to, an to answer questions anyways. Show me the code. Well, OK. <coughs> uh, let's see. So I've got a project, which I've kind of pre-written. Um, so as a, uh, a hopefully somewhat compelling example, um, I've got this project set up. Um, so I've got a, uh, a user data type, fairly straightforward. Um, the type on which we're going to see some of these programming structures is this option type. Uh, if anybody's worked in, uh, in Scala or Haskell or really any of the, the functional programming language, you'll, you'll have seen this before. It was recently, a, a very similar type was recently introduced to Java called optional. And it basically represents either a value or nothing, right? And so it's a way of encoding the possibility of a null into the type system. Um, so the, the, an option is either <coughs> not, none, as in no value, or some value of the given type. Those are the only possibilities. Okay? Um, and so we have this user. Uh, they've got an ID, a name, uh, potentially some user to which they are, they're uh, attached, and some balance. <coughs> and we have a service which Obviously, is a bit of a hack, but you know, representing like a, a DAO type stru uh, structure, um, where we have some set of users that we can look look values up from uh, by ID, and we can store new <coughs> users into. Fairly straightforward, sort of uh, sort of setup here. Okay. Um, one note. Um, there's a, a limitation in the Java type system that makes a lot of these structures awkward. 
And specifically, that limitation is that I cannot have, uh, let's do a quick, uh, so let's say I, I want a method that has a generic type, a set of generic type arguments, f and b, um, and I want to return an f of b. I can't do this in Java. I can't take a generic type argument that itself is a type constructor. So this is a limitation of the Java uh, type system. If you, uh, if you look around in functional programming, this is often referred to as a higher kinded type. And it's just simply not possible within Java. Um, so to work around that, what I've done is created this uh, basically empty interface. Um, and the interface provides, oops, so anywhere you would want to say uh, something like this, instead you can say, and it's just a way of encoding that same, uh, that same level of type information. Is that clear for everyone? Actually, uh, uh, two quick questions. Um, is everyone here familiar with uh, Lambda uh, expressions in, in Java 8, like the new uh, new lambdas. Anyone is anyone not familiar with lambdas? Okay, so some of the syntax here might be a little strange for you guys. I'll try to point out what it means when I get to it. Um, the other one is er everyone familiar with default uh, functions in uh, Java 8, so interface default interface functions. Or again, is anyone not familiar with those? Okay, so we're now allowed to provide an implementation for a function in an interface. And that, that implementation will be used by default. Effectively, it gives us the ability to do multiple inheritance in Java, sort of, uh, with some limitations. But those are two features that I'm going to use quite a bit in here. And so I, I wanted to check. I'll, I'll be sure to point out why, what's happening when I hit those spots. OK, so let's, uh, so if we wanted to do something with this, uh, this interface, or with this uh, service, let's say we wanted to let people deposit uh, some funds into a, to increase their balance. Uh, I'm going to create a, a test here to show what that might look like. Sorry, Please. Yes. Um, uh, probably. <laughs> You're not only live editing. Yeah, I know. Uh, well, let's try 30. Is that, can everyone see that? All right. I'll, uh, I'll also close that off so it's not so in the way. So we have a, a test here. We're going to, um, look up a user from, from the user service. Um, and because a lookup may or may not have a user, we get an option of a user. Um, and if I'm not using any sort of uh, any of these structures, the first thing I'm going to have to do next <laughs> is check, does, did I actually get a user back, right? So I'm going to, you know, the, and the equivalent, if we're doing things traditionally, would be doing a null check for, for the return. Um, so I, I, my null check passes, so I get the depositor out. Uh, and then I make my change. And this, uh, this user is a, an immutable data structure. So any setter basically just returns a new user with the new uh, settings uh, changed. And I store the new user. So fairly straightforward test, but pretty ugly, right? I mean, I've got, you know, this is all basically uh, boilerplate. And I'm going to have it all over the place. You know, null checks suck. Uh, they, they suck no matter where you find them. Um, <laughs> so why don't we see if we can do a little better? So let's introduce um, a, uh, one of these structures out of, uh, uh, out of category theory. So through the magic of Git, um, I've gone and typed. Let's have a look. So this functor. So a functor 
uh, we even have some, some comments here. Woohoo. Um, so a functor is uh, a context in which uh, calculations might happen. So in the case of option, option is a context in which calculations may or may not return a result. Effectively, it's a partial function. It works for some possible inputs, but not for all of them. Um, so the, the thing that you'll find in category theory is all of these structures have, have two um, basic uh, properties, right? They'll have some set of, of abstract methods that need to be provided that are specific to the type they operate on. And those, they will also have a set of laws that those interfaces must adhere to. So in our case, we have functor. Functor has map, right? Uh, and if we kind of look at the, the types here, and I'll, I'll, real quick, I'll do this. Uh, so we have f, a, and b are our, our type argument types. And we're going to return an f of b. And we're going to take in an f of a and a function from a to b. Okay, so if, if Java supported higher kind of types, the type signature would probably look something like this. And so we're taking a, um, let, let's say list for argument's sake, a list of, of some type and a function from that type to some other type. Oop. This is why I don't do live coding demos. Um, and we're getting back a list of the second type. So if, if anyone here has worked with uh, the Java 8 streams, map exists on stream, and it does exactly the same thing there. Uh, and it's just going to take whatever elements are, are inside the original container, modify them using the function, and produce a new container with the, the results. Right? Is that, if I lost anybody, we're all good? OK. So there's, I, I mentioned laws. Well, there's two laws that a functor has to, to, to um, follow. Right? The first is identity. Oops. So basically, if I say, whoops, map, okay, uh, uh, actually, you know what? Let me say. So if I map the identity function, so I mentioned lambda, uh, the lambda syntax, this a to a basically creates a new method somewhere, and you don't really need to worry about where, um, that uh, takes in a single argument and returns exactly that same argument. It does nothing, right? So if I map over a function that does nothing, I should get back the thing I started with. Simple enough. Right. The second one is a little more complex. So if I map over one function and then map the result over a second, okay. So I'm using the result of, oops, missed a comma. So if I take the result of using one function via map and then uh, map again using a second one, then my results should be the same as if I had mapped using and sorry about the uh, and so and then basically produces a new function that applies f and then applies g to the result, right? So these two things should produce the exact same results, and if I follow those two laws. Then, so what do I get, right? Great, I've, I've done this. What does that give me? Well, it means that all of these other functions that are, are available in functor will, will work correctly, okay? And that's the, the benefit from the cost of following these structures, is I get a whole bunch of, of stuff for free. Um, the ones on functor aren't really all that interesting. Um, compose is kind of neat. If I have a functor that works on option and I have a functor that works on list, I can put them together and get a functor that works on options of lists or lists of options, right? Which can come in handy depending on the interfaces you're dealing with. Um, but 
So let's, let's dive in a little bit. So one thing I've done, I've got a, an instance of functor for option here. And you can see what it does is uh, if you've got nothing, then it returns the same nothing. Um, and if you've got something, it, um, if you'll ignore the, the syntax here, it applies the function you gave it to that thing and returns a new <coughs> something of the result. Right, so you get a new value of the result. Um, and one thing I've added here is just for to, to help keep things kind of fluent while I'm using this, I'm using that map function inside option so that I can say dot map, dot map, dot map, and, and I, I don't have to keep wrapping one thing inside the other. So let's have a look at what is this going to do to our test here for deposit? Well, so I'm still going to have to get a user, right? But now I can uh, map over it, and I can get the user out of that. And I can So all of this code was replaced by those three lines. And I'm not a big fan of lines of code as a measure of how good or bad something is. But I think more importantly, you can very quickly see what I'm doing here, right? I'm, taking, I'm getting some user. I'm going to set that user's balance to get a new user from that. And then I'm going to store that. There's none of the null checks. There's none of this sort of noise around it. Right? You might say there wasn't really that much noise in the first place, but um, if we look a little further down, right, if we want to transfer money back and forth, now we have to check if the person sending it and the person was receiving it are both exist, and we have to check that there's enough money and, and so on. So there's, you know, there's a lot more noise that can happen. Right? So why don't we, is, it, have I, is everyone clear so far? Have I lost anyone? No? Good? Okay. Um, is there any way that you can say why get is called? Why get is called and you get the user? Uh, sorry, say that you again. Said, you said and we, we will get the user. Oh. So down below we have maybe deposit dot get. Right. So map is is a way of saying um, run this function on the user if they exist. Right, and so you becomes the, the value contained by this option. Does that make sense? It makes sense. I just don't see how you, you're dealing with an option, not a user, and yet you get a user. Well, let, so let's look at the, the implementation of map, right? Yeah. So, so here, we're, get, we're being passed an option of something, yeah. right? And a function from that to something else, right? And so, if this option was none, we're going to return none because the, the result of doing something to nothing is still nothing, right? But if, that, if this option actually contains a value, then we extract, because inside the, the functor we know what an option is, we extract the value, that's what this, this get here is, right? And we pass that into the provided function, right? This is why lambdas would be, without lambdas, this would you could still do this. It would be the, the code would be horrific. Like the, the amount of you know nested inner abs uh, like uh, inner anonymous classes everywhere would be like it, it would make writing uh, it, uh, graphics code look clean in, in by comparison. Is it fair to say that like from the map, you're, if, if the option was none, it's like you're mapping over an empty collection. Effectively, yeah. And if the option was was an actual user, then you're mapping over a collection of one thing. Right? Exactly. So mapping over an empty collection is never a call. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and actually, that's one another way of thinking of option is of uh, thinking of it as a list that may contain either nothing, no uh, no items, or one item, but never any more than that, right? So none would be an empty list, 
and sum is a list of a single item, right? And that's one way to, to, when you're looking at a lot of these, that's one way to look at, uh, at option. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, some of these get ugly. Uh, Monad, which if we have enough time, we'll get to, um, is rather famous. They, there's, uh, I, I heard one quote, a guy said, the thing about Monad is, by the time you understand Monad, you can never, uh, you can never explain Monad ever again. And, uh, and to some extent, I think he might be right. Um, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a shot at it anyways. Um, okay, so, um, let's see here. Actually, before I go there, so let's go back to this test. Okay, so that's great. Um, and I'll do withdrawal really quick um, because it's basically the same thing. Uh, so I'm gonna say, uh, let's see here. If you dot balance dot compare to amount squared in equal to zero. So I'm, I'm uh, I'm using the trinary operator here, which I normally wouldn't do, but it, it'll keep things a little quick. So what I'm saying I here is if the, the user's balance is, uh, um, is greater than or equal to the amount that you want to, to uh, withdraw, then withdraw it, otherwise return the user unmolested, right? And then store whatever the result of that is. Um, this is probably a little less efficient than you could make it, but for the sake of example, does that, does that make sense to everyone what I just did there? Is everyone familiar with the trinary operator, by the way? Right, so uh, if this condition is true, the value of this statement is this guy. If not, then it's uh, this guy here. Cool, okay. So that, that was pretty quick. Well, now we've got deposit and withdraw. We should be able to do transfer, right? Well, let's see what we can do. So now we've got a, this one's a little more complicated, right? So let, let's say, okay, so I'm gonna say, uh, so let's grab, let's say let's grab the, the person doing the withdrawal first, okay? So, well, I, I, I have to map over this guy, right, because I need the content of it. Okay, so let, let's. So this guy will be W because we're going to withdraw from him. Um, now what am I going to do? Well, I, I need a the depositor too, right? So okay, so uh, I'm going to do that, and I guess I need to map over this too. But wait, if I do this, what's my return type going to be? Well. I have an option on the outside here, and then I have an, another option here that's gonna wrap whatever my result is. So I'm gonna have an option of an option of, that's not right, right? So if I, so let's think about the, the types here, and something you'll hear a lot from functional programming, and, and especially uh, languages like Haskell and Scala, is you know, use the types. They, they'll, they'll often, if you have a really good type system, it'll often tell you when you're making mistakes long before you, you, you would find them otherwise. Well, this map, right, oops, goes from option of something, right, let's say option of A, to option of B, right? Given a function from A to B, it goes from option of A to option of B. Well, our function in here already goes from A to option of, let's call it C. So if we sort of replace our way up, well, that's what we end up with, which is not the structure we want, right? It's gonna be kind of nasty. So they, this, this breaks. So map isn't powerful enough for what we're trying to do here. What we really want 
is map two. I want to be able to give it two of some kind and have the two of those things fed into a function of some sort and have it do whatever it's going to do magic-wise. And uh, you, know, you'll, you can take my word for it, or if you want, we can go chat after, after my presentation over a beer. But there really is no way that you can mangle, uh, with, given just functor, you can't mangle it to the point where you get what you want out of this. Right? Sooner or later, at the very least, you're going to have to use your implicit knowledge of the way an option works as opposed to anything else you have a functor for. And one of the purposes of all this is you can, all of the code that you can write here, you know, if, if I were to come along and change the, the get user by ID so that it returns a list of, of things, nothing else would need to change, right? You'd still, everything would, all the rest of the code would just work exactly the way it is so long as you had an instance of functor for list, right? And you can do the same thing with all kinds of other types. And again, so long as those types have an instance of this, this uh, category theory derived structure, you get them for free. They all behave the same way in that context, right? Um, so let's, uh, again, through the magic of Git, uh, OK, so let's have a look. So now, oh, hey, we've got an apply here. Well, what's this apply thing? So apply, let's see if I can, so if, if we're talking about option again, right? Apply takes two type arguments, A and B, just like uh, map did. So we're still, still looks a lot like map so far. And it returns, I'm going to use option here, an option of B. Again, still looks a lot like map, right? And it takes an option of A. Okay, again, we're, nothing's changed. But it takes an option of a function oops, from A to B. Right? This is, I mean, it, 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 see, wh why the hell would you ever want to give something an option of, some, of, of a function? Well, so if we kind of scroll down a little bit, we'll see exactly why. Given this structure, and sorry, one last note. Note that apply extends functor. So you still have map, right? So now you have map and apply. And there's another set of laws for apply. Again, if you want, after this is over, we can, uh, I'll, I'll happily explain it to anyone who wants to sit and have a beer. Um, but given those two things, I can now create a map two, right? And map two has three types, and it returns an option of the third, and it takes option of the first. Oh. Option of the second and a by function. Uh, does everyone know what by function is? It's a function that takes two arguments and returns one type. So this, in this case, it is a function that takes a and B as its two arguments, and returns Z as its result, right? So this looks a lot like map, except it takes two options as its arguments. Pretty straightforward, but it's exactly what we need, right? So I've gone ahead, and again, for the sake of, of brevity, I've added map2 here, so we can call map2, this dot map2, and give it only one option as the other, uh, the other value. So let's have a look at what does this do to us here. So okay, so map two, okay, and now map two takes a second option. So let's give it one. Oops. Draw, comma, deposit. 
Am I missing? So, is anyone? Uh, have I lost folks? Okay. So, uh, um, so map two. Here, let me uh, let me write it the other way. Oops. Oh, sorry. Option apply. So, so. Okay. And. so map two takes two accounts, or two users, well, two options, right? So we're going to give it the two options. And it takes a function f from two of the thing, the two things contained in those options. So withdraw and deposit users, and returns something, which will end up in an option, right? So whatever, I, if I return one here, right? what I will get out of that is option of one. But in here, right, oops, D, D is a user, and so is W. Cool? Everybody, yes? Okay. So given that I have these now, I can basically do uh, and I'll explain unit in a moment. But, well, okay? I'm a little confused about why, why your compiler thinks that W is a balance. So W, right? So let's look at, oh, let's go to back to Mac 2. Uh, right, cool. So Map 2 expects a function of A to B, right? But it's... Oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong, uh, where am I here? Here we are. Uh, so map2 expects a function from A and B to something. And A and B, in this case, are whatever the options were of. We have uh, two options of users. So the function expects two, an option from two users, or a function from two users to something. Fair? Cool. Um, now, as I said, it expects a function from two users to something. And in this case, there's really nothing that we can return that's meaningful, right? We're done. Um, and so, uh, unit, so in Java, we have void, right? I can create a, a function that has a void return type. Unfortunately, that's not actually true. What I can do is create a function that doesn't have a return period. And Java treats that differently in that I can't assign a void function to some variable. And so I can't, this, if I were to not return something here, then this isn't, this lambda isn't a function anymore. It's now a, a by consumer. It accepts two values and doesn't do it, it doesn't return anything. So in order to get all the types to line up, I have to return something, right? And I mean, I could return null here or whatever else, a lot of functional languages, rather than having void being this nothing, it, they have what they call unit, which is effectively a singleton that contains no information, right? And so you're returning, you're actively returning something that represents no information. And so that's what I've done here. Um, and if you have a look, 
Unix just a, a singleton, simple, you know. Okay. So now I can get rid of all these guys. And I'm back to something that sort of works. Cool? How are we doing for time? Am I we okay? All right. So we'll do one, one more, and then I'll, uh, I'll do my little self-pitch. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning we have this user class. May or may not, i.e. it has an option, to have some other account that it's joined to, right? So I want to be able to say I want to transfer to my joint account, right? But now I've got another option in the middle. So let, let's see if we can work this out with the set of tools we have. Right, so I'm gonna get a depositor, uh, and then I'm gonna get the joint user if there is one, and then with the joint user, that might be a withdrawer, so I, if, if they're defined, I'm gonna, and so on, right? It looks a lot like what this looked like before, but I've got this added level of complexity dealing with this effectively these two, right? I'm fetching this depositor that may or may not be there. Um, so let's, well, since we're dealing with something that's similar, if we do this, right? Uh, okay, so uh, we're gonna start with, let's say depositor. Well, I, I can't map two over this because I don't actually have a second option. Well, okay, well, my second option is maybe positor dot uh, get dot joint user. But wait, now I'm running this get. If I have none here, right, what's get going to do if I, if I have a none? Well, let's go look. None dot get. Uh-oh. I don't want that, right? Okay. Does anybody see any way to... to Anyone have any ideas? No? I don't. I, I, I need something more here, right? Apply is not enough on its own to give me this idea of dependent effects, right? So the, the, this is an effect of having or not having a user. I can't have effects that depend on one another, one after the other. Right, I can have two independent effects and deal with them. I can have two options and do something with them. But I can't have one option that depends on another that depends on another. So I need something new now, okay? So, so let's go back to the magic of Git. And I wish all programming was so cool that you could just go over and change the tab and switch to another Git commit and have everything you needed. But then I wouldn't have a job, so that would suck. So okay, so. If we go back to our, our set of categories here, okay, we've got a whole bunch of new stuff here, okay? Um, categories come in a hierarchy, and so let's have a look at the, the, some of these new ones. So let's close everything, um, and we've got these two new ones. So applicative, uh, I'll skip quickly through. It extends apply, which we've already seen, and it asks for an, one new thing called pure. Okay, and so I'll tell you pure is effectively a constructor. It says I can give you a value and you will give me back a context, the, this option in, in the case of option, that contains that value, right? Um, not very interesting from our point of view, um, but it does bias a few bits and pieces. Um, the other one is called flat map, and what flat map does, let's have a look. Th this, you know, th this structure looks a lot like some of the ones we've seen already. So let, let's translate it out into Java with higher kinded types. So we're going to return, if we had option, an option of B. Okay, still looks a lot like map and uh, applicative, or apply. Um, and we're going to take an option of A. Okay, still again, looks a lot like what we're used to. But now we've got a function from A to option of B. Does everyone see the, the distinction here? So the, the function that I'm applying to a value that potentially doesn't exist 
may or may not return a uh, value itself. Right? That's the only change here. Okay? And in the case of option, it's kind of obvious what's going to happen. I'm just going to return whatever the heck this was. Right? Because I, I had only one value to start with, I'll end up with only one value on the way out. Well, zero or one value on the way out. In the case of list, things might get a little more complicated because I might have a whole bunch of A's and I have to stick them all together later. But the whole point is, this is abstract. So the, the implementation of the, the uh, flat map is what's going to worry about how this happens for me. And again, as long as what it worries about, the way it, it solves that problem meets some set of laws, I get a whole bunch of functionality for free. And I kind of cheated. I didn't mention this guy. There's Monad. Hey, I, I mentioned him earlier. Um, and Monad is basically an applicative with flat map. That's all it is. Uh, and the only uh, thing you see here, oops, is actually a new implementation of map. So you can get map for free from these guys. And you can flat map over something and use the combination of pure and flat map, you can create map. Um, and so let's, so again, we've got an option monad, right? An implementation of, of monad for option. And again, I've gone and just for the sake of, of brevity in the code, I've given us flat map on option directly, right? And so I don't have to do this, but it makes the code a little easier to read later on. Okay, so let's go, sorry. I'm used to thinking of flat map as something where for each value in the sort of collection you're processing, mm -hmm. you return a whole collection of things. That's correct. But this one is going to return nothing or one thing? Well, I if you think about it, that statement still holds. If you think of option as a list, uh, sorry, so the question was, uh, were you, uh, he's used to, to thinking of flat map as a, a like map, but where you can return a whole collection for each item in the original collection. So if you think of option as a collection of either zero or one thing, and you can return a collection of either zero or one thing from that. Right. That's, that's, so that, that same pattern applies. Okay, but with this flat map, you couldn't produce two values for one thing. Correct, because option itself won't, you, you can only produce an option, right? You have to produce the same type that it, you started with. And so uh, this is something that the, the way that the Java 8 uh, uh, streams work is everything gets converted into a stream and then you can do these operations on streams. And streams are, for the most part, a monad and, and they fulfill a lot of these structures. The problem is, is that you're, you can't do this on anything but a stream. So you have to go have two stream and collect on either end of this chain of events. And so if you want to do this with things like option, you have to deal with the possibility that someone's generated a whole bunch of values somewhere in the middle. And now you have no way to kind of collect them back into an option, right? So you can do things that would be nonsensical otherwise. Um, this gives you the, 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 using the structures this way means that we know we're dealing with an option the whole way through and we can't have a function that produces stuff that we can't deal with later. Um, so let's go back to that test. Okay. So what do we want to do here? So So let's uh sorry. Okay. So um actually that's probably a flat map, but let's find it, let's find out. <coughs> Sorry, where am I? Okay, here we are. So we're gonna with, so the deposit. Uh, okay, so this guy is now D. So D dot joint user. So this is an option now, right? So we're going to flat, or no, probably just map here. Now let's find out. Uh, so we have our depositor. Uh, we have uh, an ID for a withdrawer, right? And now we're gonna let's see what happens here.
right? So we're getting, uh, now we're getting the withdraw, the user from whom we're going to withdraw. So now we're gonna do, now we've got everybody. So now we can do a map. Actually, I can get rid of some of these. Okay. Um, Correct. Okay. Yeah. So we can look here. We have an option of long. Okay. okay. And uh, I've probably got a whole bunch of missing bits and pieces there, but let's see where we end up. Closing there, and we're closing there, and that's that. Okay, so that was a bit of a, a mess, so let's walk through what happened here. So we're saying we're going to get the, the depositing user, right? So D is now a user who is the user from to whose account we're going to deposit some money, right? We're going to get the account that's joined to that, right? So we have the withdrawer's ID. Okay, so again, we're, we're sort of, so it's flat map. Now we're going to use map. Did I do that wrong? Oh, no, I've got a mistake here. Let's, actually, why don't we, oh, so you see, I have option of option, right? I made a mistake in here with the type, so I needed to flat map here because the function I'm using inside is map, which is going to return an option of something. So I want to flatten up all the way. Um, there we are. OK. So I've got my uh, withdrawal account ID. I'm going to fetch the withdrawal account. And now I want to map over again. So I, now I've got. In D, I've got the account I want to deposit to. In W, I've got the account I want to withdraw from. And now my logic is identical to what it was up here. If this was a function, I could just drop that function name in there. I wouldn't need the, the code. You can, you can pass function references into these things. Um, and so I've got exactly the same behavior. And now I have the ability to handle dependent effects. Right, so where I have the effect of maybe having or maybe not having um, a value, and I can do that when I, I'm going to operate on that and then maybe or maybe not get a value from it and so on. I can chain these things, right? Um, so if you wanted to report an error, if somebody tried to do a joint transfer. So, um, so there are monads out there, uh, specifically in that case, you have a few options uh, from the Scala standard libraries. I don't, I don't believe these exist today in Java, but you have try, and not in the sense of try catch, but in the sense of uh, try is sort of like option, where option either has a value or doesn't. Try either has a value or has a throwable, right? So it either has a value or an error. Um, you have either, which either has a value of one type or the value of another. And that traditionally would be like the other would be an error message or something to that effect. Um, so there, you would have you would use one of those types, and somewhere you would where where you're returning here an option, you would you would instead return uh, a try which may or may not have a value, and you use try all the way back up. Even from this, I guess. Correct. It would evaluate to none, yeah. right? So you could, you could do something like if uh, uh, unit option dot oops dot is uh, is empty. Exception. Or instead of returning unit, that is since you could return a transaction ID. 
Yep. And then your whole Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And at which point, because you're returning an option, if you you wanted to build on that, you could now have uh, you could use flat map further up to to combine transactions in some way. Got it. Right. So eventually, what you report back? Something. That a transaction happened or not. Exactly. Uh, and if you wanted to be able to report why a transaction didn't happen, that's when you're going to use something like either or try or, or something like that effect. Yeah, because you would lose, you'd lose the information online. Exactly, yeah. <coughs> and that's, so option only brings back the existence or not of something, like returning null, right? I mean, I mean, in effect, all we've done here is gotten the type system to help us remember that we might not have a value coming out, right? That, that's all option really does is we're getting the type system to help us more. Um, and I'm, I'm in a Java user group, not a Ruby user group, so we, we all actually realize that the type system helping us is a good thing. Um, <laughs> so I'm not a Ruby guy, so yeah, as you can tell. So any, any other questions? Anybody? No? OK, that's all I have as far as uh, example code. Um, actually, I will show you one thing, which is the uh, So this is the set of these structures that I've implemented so far in the open source project I mentioned. And there are more. Um, that's pretty close to all of them. That's probably about 90% of them. Um, and each of them has these sorts of you know, interdependencies. Uh, and so again, you, know, you, you implement these two things, and you get all of this stuff for free. right? So it's that type of, of structure. Um, and back to here. Okay. All right. So there are a set of libraries in Scala that implement these things. Um, the granddaddy of them was something called Scala Z or Scala Z because I guess they're Americans, but whatever. Um, more recently, someone has started a. a Library they call cats, C A T S, um, and they make all sorts of jokes about, you know, being cats, but it's categories, uh, and that's the library that I when I started uh, working on this talk, I, I was basing some of my work off of stuff that's in that library, um, and I found it actually was kind of an interesting challenge to get all that stuff to work in Java. The the whole kind thing was really not easy. Uh, a lot of this stuff depends on the idea of multiple inheritance. So the, the, you know, dealing with the, the interfaces and default uh, methods and stuff, it was all really kind of interesting to me. And so I ended up spending a lot more time porting that stuff over to Java and far more of it than I actually needed to do this talk because I found it kind of interesting. And I thought it, was, it would be a neat project uh, to learn more about these structures myself and maybe for other people to learn, uh, people who aren't familiar with a more functional language to, to have something they can use to learn some of these things. Um, so. Uh, all of it's up on GitHub, um, and uh, you know I, I'm hoping if I can get it somewhat complete to put, get it pushed out to Maven Central and all that. Um, and if anyone's interested in in helping out with it, in in contributing uh, or you know learning from it or whatever else, uh, see me after the talk, and I'll I'll buy you a beer and we can chat. And that's that. Nope, there we are. Okay, so let me. Pull this up. So, what's a monad? Um, so, a monad, where are we here? There it is. Okay. A monad is any structure, okay, that provides uh, pure, apply, and flat map, those three functions. And I can show you them if you like. So pure is basically that constructor-ish function. Um, uh, pure, that's uh, apply, is that map looking thing that takes an, uh, uh, a wrapped function as the second argument. And flat map is the one that takes a function that returns that wrapped second argument, right? Where, uh, where are we here? Okay where uh, these two 
uh, laws are true. So one is if you do um, pure and then flat map some function, it's the same as just applying the function normally, right? And the second is if you do, um, where are we here? If you flat map the pure function, then you end up with the original thing that you, so if the function that returns is just the constructor again. So saying uh, flat map over option of one, and then saying, you know, pass the argument in and new option of whatever you just passed in, just returns the original, op or something that's equal to the original option. Okay. Right. So if you pass those two laws plus the laws that, that have come before for applicative and, and all of its inherited uh, things, that's a monad, right? I, I get those two things in isolation, but I can't, I don't understand how you would apply that to, say, the banking problem. Um, so that's, that's coming to sort of the edge of what I'm kind of getting. Okay. So given those two things, so so I, I give that answer, it's kind of an, an, an unfulfilling one, right? Uh -huh. the, the, the other answer I can give you is much more general, but perhaps not as good in, in other ways. And it's that monads, so all of these structures to some extent are um, a way to express an effect in the type system. So in the case of option, we're talking about the effect of, of possibly having or not having a value, right? So, and I, I'm saying effect, not side effect, because we're expressing it in the type system, so we know what's happening, right? Monads are a way of expressing dependent effects. So where the, we may or may not have something, and then we're going to, from that, do something that may or may not give us something. And we want to be able to do this in, you know, in sequence, okay. right? So that, that these effects depend on one another, and therefore have to execute <coughs> in sequence. Okay. Right? Example, but you kind of do that thing we wanted to do where you never end up with nested options of things. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So there has to be a real big advantage to using fun the functional style because if you're a development manager like I am, mm -hmm. you go out to hire people, you can hire a Java programmer, you can hire yep. a C sharp programmer, but your pool gets really small in terms of the number Very. of people who are ultimately in the future yep. understand this. So so is why do it? I'm trying to wrestle yep. with this myself. Is there a big enough advantage that overcomes the sort of complexity? I, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, what I can tell you is what I think. And given, so I don't know if you've ever tried to write Java that's massively multi-threaded. But nightmare is probably the nicest thing I can say, right? When you're dealing with, uh, with large amounts of concurrency, any system that involves globally mutable state is, in my opinion, doomed to fail at some point. Someone is going to forget to synchronize some function somewhere, and sooner or later, it is going to bend you over a table, right? Functional programming, one of the, the basic precepts is no globally mutable state, period, right? And a lot of these structures are ways to achieve the semblance of globally mutable state without actually having globally mutable state, right? And so they, they let you have that massive level of concurrency without shooting yourself in the foot repeatedly, possibly at the same time. Um, so do I think it's valuable? Yes. Do I think the average developer in five years is going to understand this or be able to give the talk I just gave? No. 10 years, no. The reality is, is that more and more of the libraries that developers use to achieve things that are that involve concurrency will involve a lot of this stuff under the hood. Will everybody need to know all of these details? No, they're going to know that just like the, the today's Java pro developers, uh, anyone who's up to the current release of the JDK at least, knows that if I have a list and I turn it into a stream and then I map, I get in back another list of the you know, that it's like doing for each and creating a new list, right? That's what they know, and that's really all they need to know, right? Um, they don't need to necessarily understand the underpinnings. Yeah. 
right? The library writers, I, I think the bar for writing libraries that can be used in, in massively multi-threaded environments is going to go up over time. But I don't think the average, you know, Joe developer is going to need to to do that. So it's you probably want at least one or two people on your team who can look through this and say, yeah, okay, I get that, because you may need to expand on those libraries at some point. The the odds that you're doing something so complex that you actually need everyone on the team to be able to do this probably not. I mean, being realistic, I'm, I'm sure Google will try to have everybody on the team everywhere be able to do this, but. You know, like the, the reality is, is on a team, you're going to have some people who need to understand this, and most people don't. That's purely my opinion, you know, not the opinion of my employer, yada, 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 whatever. Uh, I'm probably going to get shot just for saying that, by the way. Just, uh, cool? Great. Yeah? All right. All right.